Yeah, so my name is Janelle Mercantine, and I am the owner and director at On Point Room Solutions. And my partner with me today, um, Melissa Cunningham, she works with me at On Point. We, she wears many hats, I'll just let you talk about some of those hats. Um, so I met Janelle originally from, uh, through my at time second grade boy, who was having problems with school, specifically reading and writing, and some behavioral issues too. So we took them to Janelle, and um, our dyslexic dysgraphic kiddo now wants to be a professional writer when he grows up. Um, he's above grade level and everything, and flourishing socially. Um, it's been a wonderful trail. I also have, we learned during that journey that um, my wonderful husband Daniel is also sharing those traits with our son. Uh, so I am a lover of visual spatial learners. So um, we're going to talk about today uh, the visual spatial and the three-dimensional learner in a linear world. Okay, what's that mean? Um, it is a visual spatial cognitive process. So when we say cognitive process, we are talking about not the are you, is your learning style tactile, visual, auditory, experiential. That is a learning style. We're talking about after your senses have gathered that information, what does your brain want to do with it? How does your brain want to organize it? It's a neurological wiring. That's your visual spatial cognitive process. So you will either be linear, a linear process, which follows the pattern of language, T-H-E-C-A-T, the cat. That's what you'll see or hear or a combination of both. So your eyes see, your ears hear, and it brings understanding. We can look at brain scans and see that process, that sequence happening. Or you will be neurologically wired to be what we are calling a visual spatial. Okay, so your eyes see it, your senses gather it, and then your brain takes it to an area that records experiences. So you from zero up have been collecting experiences and that information is kept there. So as your senses gather it, your brain takes it to that area to understand it, you have understanding. So an example this could be is a toddler comes in for a linear person, a toddler comes into a room and there's a cat curled up in the corner in a ball and, and a linear kid goes, hmm, interesting. And he toddles over a little bit closer and he goes, it is round and there's hmm, texture. Interesting. Next step closer, the cat begins to twitch his tail. The round textured thing has a tail. Hmm, interesting. A little bit closer, the cat perks his head up to see what's coming at him. And the individual linear process puts one, two, three, four together and goes, look at this. It is a cat. Okay, linear process, visual spatial process. The kiddo has had experiences with cats, okay? In his past, he toddles into the room and sees the fur ball with texture and puts that into his place where other experiences have been, and he compares and, and looks at that patient, that is a cat, and he knows it's a cat. And sure enough, he toddles over to it, and the cat looks at him, it's not. That's the two different processes, two different neurological wiring that we operate with. The visual spatial learning process, okay, linear process, it wants to study each piece at a time. And we'll look at the school system, we'll look at reading, learning to read, math. They'll take the individual pieces, we'll, they'll study them individually. And then after they have said, okay, this is this, and this piece does, looks like this, shape, weight, whatever, they begin to put the pieces together. As the pieces get put together, they begin to see, oh, we have a house. Where the visual spatial individual needs to start with the house. Let's start with the whole. Let's look at the whole. Let's understand the whole. Now, let's tear it apart and begin to look at the pieces in it as individuals. So linear process, visual spatial process, two very different, almost opposite thinking. 
styles and approaches. The visual spatial thinking process is multidimensional. All of the senses are engaged in creating that picture. So it's got, it can have sight, you can see it, it can have sound, it can have taste, it can have color, it can have feeling, you can feel the texture sometimes in those pictures, it has art. And depending on the individual, you will be gifted in certain elements. So some people are more feelers, some people are more very structured visually, they can see the building, they can put three dimension in this building, they can add to this building, where others may not see that building so much as they can feel that building. I read an article about a late, a gal from England who is dyslexic by diagnosis. She grew up in a single um, parent home, they were really poor. So she began home to help support the family at six, seven, eight, three. And she began to observe about herself that when she smelled different fragrances in her visual spatial ability, she saw them as, as spectrums of color. And she began to put spectrums of color together to create perfumes. And she turned her kitchen as she grew up, turned her kitchen into a, a factory or a manufacturing place for these perfumes. And she became really good at it using this visual spatial talent. Now at school, was not successful. But was she successful? Yes, because she has this incredible gift of being visual spatial. Now she, her company's public and she lives in New York as the article said. So anyway, so it's really a gift to have. Linear process works at 450 thoughts a second, where a visual spatial process operates at 2,200 thoughts a second. And that's before it really even gets to work day. It often runs at subconscious thought speeds, which are 24 and faster. And so a lot of times the visual spatial will be working on a problem and all of a sudden they just have a solution. Why? Because the brain works so quickly. They will just be able to subconsciously problem solve and then there's the solution. Well, would you please write that problem down, the math problem down on how you got there? I'm a, often on little visual spaces will be like, oh, I'm not going to, I hate it, I'm not going to write it. I can just do it in my head. And they are right. At subconscious speeds, it is happening. And they almost, honestly sometimes don't know how they got there. It's just there. Okay, that's why. All right, so we've got the giftedness. They're often architects, they're often crazy music, talented musicians, um, designers. Athletes, mechanics, car drivers, pilots, uh, there's our list. Serial entrepreneurs. Serial entrepreneurs because it's that creative mind that's out of the box that makes them excellent at what they do. All right, but every gift, every superpower can have its kryptonite. We also have its counterpart, the very reason that individual is so gifted and talented about all these other things can also be at the root of why dyslexia exists, why dysgraphia, which is just dyslexia in writing, uh, autism, people, individuals on the spectrum, um, Asperger's auditory processing disorder, executive function disorder, and a lot of like ADHD um, barriers that an ADHD individual face. Um, why? Why do these challenges occur? And what causes these challenges to happen? So, when a visual spatial goes into their creative space, well, let's take a look at the next slide. Let's start there. So let's talk about the dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, any dyslexia in reading, writing, and math. Let's start there. And auditory processing disorder. Is that that creative space is always in motion. Now, this is a simple graphic, so we can keep up with it. But the line doesn't change into something else as the brain is creative with it. You just see more about her, learn more about her. But look at the word it falls apart. So writing, spelling, reading, math, math process, it's all requiring things to hold still. Symbols are only correct when they're orientated in one way. And Daniel's got this creative little thing with his hand that you can do. The P can be a B, and if your mind can't, I can't even do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nimble enough. But it just creates so much confusion. So this 
this creative mind, and this has always been so easy for the individual until they hit school. Now we're asked to do linear process. Writing is a process, linear process. Speech is a linear process, and so on. So when we're asked to do this, and he's okay, junior, sit down and learn these ABCs. I got that. Okay, bring it on. And so you get your ABCs, and your brain takes it into creative space. And sometimes I'm right, and sometimes I'm wrong. And I really don't know why I'm right, and I really don't know why I'm wrong. So then it becomes an emotional component. Now we have frustration. It's like, well, teacher, well meaning, loving most of the time. Person says, I know, just focus a little harder. Well, they only knew, right? <laughs> How hard am I focusing? So you focus a little harder. And that was bring us in faster. So now that P is just doing backflip. And Begins the, the challenge. Just begin the challenge of dyslexia, dysgraphia is born. Okay? It didn't start there, it's actually created. Okay, and that's the why behind that. The next component is, is that we have in all this visual spatial space, all the, all the senses are there. I already said that. And there becomes a, a disorientation, a separation between what's really happening in real time. And what I'm personally experiencing, important to realize that. So if I'm, and we all can do that to a certain degree. So if you've ever been in a meeting and it was just so incredibly boring, hopefully not this one, and um, and you, your the lecture starts and then you're like you're checked out. You're like, Whoo, I'm on the beach and I'm sitting on my beach chair, my feet, the waves are lapping against my toes, and I am disoriented. My physical body is at the meeting. But my senses are deep in my imagination, just checked out. Until somebody calls my name, hey, Sean, what do you think about this? Look, oh, I'm back. Okay, what were we talking about? Disorientation. So when our beautiful little creative minds are in a creative space, we got a little story to tell you. This is what can happen. They walk up to the stove, they smell cake. Hmm, smells good. They see cake, hmm, go creative. They're seeing it, smelling it, okay? They walk it, tasting it. They walk up to the stove to investigate, interesting. They reach up to grab for the cake, but the stove is hot. Then something happens. They're in their creative space. All the senses are engaged in the picture that they have in their mind. And the experience now is recorded with confusion. It's not simply the, the hot stove or the cake. It all comes together. And what happens is at a critical time in early childhood development, from zero to two, two to four, four to six, we are designed to neurologically, through experience, hardwire concepts, identity, I'm an individual, that's where it starts, and then it goes to change, cause and effect, before and after, time, sequence, order, disorder, and there's 43 of these developmental concepts that are being recorded through my experiences. Well, my experiences are gathered through my senses, but if all my senses are in my creative space thinking about that cake, when I touch, or this kiddo touches that hot burner, Wow, ah! he's in his creative space. So the data that's recorded, the experience that's recorded, is muddled, as it is here in this picture. What happened? What made it happen? I don't know. So neurologically, the concepts of cause and effect of this in this picture are recorded in correctly. Okay, what or change or sequence. So it begins to create symptoms that we see in executive dysfunction. What causes struggles with time management? It's starting a task but never getting to finish this task. Starting 50 tasks. <laughs> okay. Where's this root? What causes this challenge? Challenges with understanding people, them understanding us. What's causing these things? Melissa's well, got a great example of some. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
our sweet little boy, Jonesy, when he was young, I straightened my hair, curly hair. I straightened it and I picked him up at school. He would melt down. Completely melt down. This is in second grade. Um, I didn't know why. I hadn't met Janelle yet. I had no idea what these concepts were. As soon as he went through a program with her and he integrated, sorry, and he integrated change into his neural system, it wasn't a problem anymore. I could do whatever I wanted later. He'd say, hmm, he changed it. I'm not thrilled with it. But all right. It was not a dramatic breakdown. He did not have the concept of change successfully integrated. And it's a neurological development piece. So what we can do is we can go back and we can give individuals tools that allow us to turn off that creative space, never stopping it, but learning to control when I use it and when it's not helping me. Handy. Then we can go back and we can create the missing concepts through experience. And the brain is healthy, the brain is designed to do that, so that when we plug them into that technique, we can go back and we can integrate the true feeling and experience of change, cause and effect, before and after, time, sequence, sequences in time. And what the effect of that is, is that this model picture now then becomes very clear. You touch a hot burner, the effect is a burner. Um, and then we see the change in the effects of being able to manage time, being able to organize my thoughts, be able to start a task, see the end, and create the sequence to get there. And a lot of these executive dysfunctions began to disappear to create concepts. Yeah, how many of you can relate to time feeling like it's being dragged by a snail? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead and do them. Oh, oh. So um, I'm not in the camera, so maybe. Okay. So go ahead and do the next one. Time. If your internal clock and your recording um, of time, your logical recording of time, you will either be running slightly faster than time, and therefore it'll seem like you don't have enough time to get everything done. So you will think, I have this list. And I have so much to do, and I got the chores, and I got this project, and, uh, and oh. <laughs> anybody experienced that? Is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very real. I'm not making fun of it. It's very real, and this is the why behind that is because the internal setting of time is not in alignment with the with actual time. We don't control time. Time does, and the, the ticking of time does not change, but we do in our internal setting of time, and of our internal clock, yeah, can change. We can either be slower than real time or faster than real time. If we're faster than real time, we're just, just so hard to get it all lined out. Very good. Okay, so have, I'm just curious, have you guys ever experienced a situation where you sit down to a task and you have dinner plans in two hours, and you sit down to work on something that you're really passionate about? You get into your zone, you work and you work and you work, you look about Back at the clock, and it's four hours later, <laughs> and you've got 18 messages on your phone. What's the, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that is a common challenge that um, I've experienced personally. <laughs> okay, so how do we support this? Some coping mechanisms. Let's go and run through, study, and time. Setting times when doing tasks that are either Way bored or very engaged. Seven timers. All right. At an angle. Meditation. Release tools. Energy dial tools. These some tools that we give uh, individuals. So an energy dial is using that ability to visualize in your head. We use what's easy for us. Visualization's easy. So you create a dial in your head and setting one. I'm sleeping. Create a picture of the feeling of sleeping. Tie it to the one. Two, well, what would you do that's slightly faster than sleeping? Well, maybe you're just getting up. Make a middle picture, attach it to two. We have nine settings, and 10 settings on the style. And we just set a picture for each one. So I know that I tend to get a bit anxious right before I do this task or that task, or I know this one's gonna be hard to stay awake in. I can visualize my clock, 
bring my dial to that setting, and because I have a picture to it, pictures are powerful for us. They influence how we feel. Like, for example, if I said, bring up a time that you were just really excited about something, bring that memory back to your mind. Bring it so that it's there. What were you wearing? What was around you? You can feel your person change a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. And the more you engage in that picture, the more it influences how you feel. So we have found that then to be a useful way of it to actually monitor. Ooh, yeah, well, I just found that. Bring my dial down. Nice. Engage us. Realizing that you are communicating, you are thinking in imagery, and the person that you're talking to cannot see that picture. And often in relationships, we can have communication misses because it's there, and you're talking from that picture, and they're looking at you going, ah. <laughs> Helps you take a step back and go, oh, they don't see what I see. Ask them. What do you understand so far of what I've said so that you know what's there and what's not there? Because if you just keep going, you still maybe they're just losing them. So stop. Hey, Melissa, what's your picture or what's your understanding of what I've said so far? Say whatever they say. Now you know what needs to be filled with it. When communicating to a visual spatial, okay, so that's a visual spatial communicating to somebody else. But now you're going to communicate to a visual spatial. Hey, Daniel, I've got something to share with you. Let me know when you're, ready, when you're ready to hear me. What you're doing is respecting that when a visual spatial is in their mind, they're disengaged from right now. So their ears aren't hearing what's going to be said, etc. So give them a moment to regroup and come to you. Okay, I'm here. Good. I'm here with you. Then go, great. This is what I need to share with you. Share it. Hey, what's your understanding of what I just said? They share back. Now you know if you've communicated, and then you know what you might need to fill in as far as gaps go. And then a lot of miscommunication can be corrected and frustration can be resolved. These, however, notice are coping mechanisms. What can be done is even a level further, and that is, this is a huge topic, so I know that in this amount of time together, we're just taking that brush stroke across it, okay? So we, there's two other sessions that we, we have that really dig deeper into the what's going on and what do we do to correct and support. But what can be, what, but I'll touch on this. Coping mechanisms are great, but we can go a level deeper in that we can give tools that actually give us, like I touched on a bit before, turn off that visual spatial, engage other areas of the brain that are responsible for linear thought. We can take play as a modality and we can recreate those experiences once we have that ability to turn creative off. And we can integrate neurologically so that I don't struggle with the concept of time anymore. It's neurologically there, so I'm thinking with it my communication is improved, sequencing, and so on. So we can actually do a lot of work to resolve the challenges by going to the root of why they're there. So, and the brain is so plastic. Yeah. It's so you've worked with people as young as, what, five? Mm -hmm. And in their centers. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for having us here. We have so enjoyed meeting you. And are there any questions? Yeah, Can you tell me how this relates to the um, modern uh, education system that, we're, that we send our kids to? Yes. Cool. Well, this is our expert on this. I'm going to try to never to her. So having um, a kid who's visual spatial really opened my eyes to the challenges in the public education system. Um, I haven't met a teacher yet who doesn't care about her students. But I also haven't met a public education system yet that gets them, all of them. The education system is archaic, as most of you know, I would guess, most uh, people know. It was designed to train factory workers, not innovators. Follow rules, don't get too smart, so I don't want you to question authority. <laughs> that doesn't work too well with a visual spatial kiddo, because they're going to question things. That's the way their brain works. 
they're going to take, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. Oh, let's turn around. Oh, we can do it this way and get it done 10 minutes faster. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do it the way you were told to do it. Um, so they praise linear processing when we had a discussion about this earlier. Um, rather than creative, visual, uh, spatial processing. Um, sitting down, doing that worksheet, everything is a sequence. Do this, and then do that. Turn it in. Do this, do that, turn it in. If you've got a brain that's moving five times faster than some of your other counterparts, you're going to get confused in the um, sequence. You're going to spend a lot of time bored, quite possibly. <coughs> And a lot of times in schools treat the kids as if there's something wrong with them. You got a learning difference. It's not even called a learning difference. I call it a learning difference. It's a disability. It's a disability only in this linear space. It's a gift everywhere else. So it's not a disability, it's a difference. That's my personal opinion and experience. Um, thinking outside the box is not valued typically. Part of it is time. This is how the foundation was built. It was built on linear processing. It is in a self flexible sense. And unfortunately, this leads to two very likely horrible outcomes. Um, there's a much higher criminal rate among people with learning differences when disabilities. It's frighteningly higher. Um, it varies from paper to paper that you read, and it's really difficult because what's a learning disability and what's not? How do you define that? But anywhere from um, Two to three times is likely to end up with criminal record. Um, innovation in our country suffers. We've had so many discussions about this. If we're praising linear thought, great. Linear thought's important. We need to have linear thought to keep structure. It's important. You have to have it. But we also need that out of the box thinking that red, red. Well, what about this red? There's 18 different colors of red. What kind of red do you want? How can we change that? And um we're falling behind other countries so many other countries are way ahead of us with innovation and um i really feel like a lot of that leads into our educational system because we're praising a worksheet turned in not the idea and the process behind the worksheet does that make sense yes yeah. good question and uh could it be possible to be both and then also there's like kinesthetic and others too right Yes, there's kinesthetic because that is a learning style. Kinesthetic, visual, auditory, experiential. Oh, well, it's a learning style, not it's a process. Not a neurological process. Yeah, that's how you get the information in there. Okay. And every most individuals can see an image of some kind. Even linear individuals that are hardwired linearly, you say, "Hey, can you see your cat?" Yeah, I can see. Yeah, can you see a tree? Yeah, totally. The thing that separates and what we what we can see is whoa, there you go. That's visual spatial. Is that the visual spatial can take it? They can create. There can be sound in it. There can be flavor in it. There can be. It just can come alive. It can have feeling in it. It can, have, you know, and, and it's three dimensional most of the time, depending on the giftedness of the individual. So yes, everybody can picture, but it doesn't go to this degree. How do they know that? Is that a conjecture or is there lab evidence like that? There's lab evidence. When you put a brain scan on an individual and say, hey, be your creative self, there's an area that lights up that's responsible for that activity. When you take a linear individual and say, you know, do these processes with us, do this exercise with us, there's a different sequence that lights up. So could it, like, kind of left brain, right brain, could it go together or not? There, that's in, that's involved, but it's not a strict rule. There, it, there have been some conversation around. Well, I'm right brain, I'm left brain. Honestly, we we need both sides to to function as human beings. So it isn't a strict right brain left brain function. Um, it is. I use I use experience to process my information. That's a visual spatial. Yeah. Did I answer that? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk to why it's so important to, to use that clay modality rather than just understanding stuff in a linear in an in intellectual manner? Yes, absolutely. When we're taking, that's a great question. Um, when we take and, and build it outside of 
so out here in front of me and I'm using I'm using my creative component to construct whatever we're constructing the idea of change something becoming something else I'm using my creative to do that when we do that there's a physical thing that happens and um, I record that as an experience and that's the difference so I can read about riding a bike okay there's my intellectual or I can go get on that bike and experience, which is a better learning, which is deeper. And so that's how that play works, is we create an experience, because they're putting the creativity into play. When we work with adults, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. Oh, yeah, uh, geniuses. Yes. Um, most of them come to us just because they said, this is really getting to the point where it's affecting my ability to fully engage my passion. I get started, and I just can't get past this point where time management isn't there. And so they come to us. And it's not like we're not dealing with people who are failing. They can be hugely successful, but there's just a part of their life that isn't working out the way they'd like to. And the concept of the program change that. How do you know which one you are? I mean, if you've been doing it, like I feel like I'm. Well, actually, I kind of feel like I'm a robot. I don't know, actually. How do you diagnose yourself? Um, well, we can do assessments. It's a simple process and say, hey, we've got to sit you down, run you through an assessment. And if you are visual spatial, you won't be able to do what we're asking you to do in the way that we ask you to do it, right? So it's very simple to see which way your brain wants to put information together. Yeah. And then it is. It's not unusual to have someone who is dramatically visual spatial, but they can still kind of shift to that linear thought. Well, you're training people to shift into linear thought, though. So that's the your objective is to be able to, to get them to shift into linear so they wouldn't want to mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, be able to turn creative off, Which, slow the brain down. Right. And then yeah. And, and turning it. creative off is is turning linear off. Yeah. Um, although different parts of the brain light up. So that's another thing we could do if we had resilience of money, we could get an MRI machine and hand you a home to do. Right? And hand you something or yes. tell you to think of something and we'll say, oh, that part's lighting up very linear. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, interestingly, um, if you take a kiddo with dyslexia and you teach them what is the current standard here in the United States, which is like Morton Gillingham or something, very phonics based, uh, which is goes against a visual spatial brain. Based on MRIs, it's not, we don't hear it. We go to that part of our brain. We see it, we go to experiences, we understand it. But you can force the brain to work in a way that's not required to. But interestingly, the, the MRI showed that the level of understanding will never reach the level of understanding of a neurotypical non dyslexic or the level of understanding of a kiddo who's been taught to use a visual spatial gifts. Because they're attacking the symptom, not the cause. Because they're not working with the they're mind. not working with the mind the way the brain the mind wants to process information. And I think they're looking at what symptoms they're seeing, saying, "Well, obviously we're not getting the phonemes down. We're not, you know, putting this together phonetically appropriately. So let's just keep repeating this over and over in a slower fashion to get it down." <laughs> right. Yeah. And will, he will see improvement, but that um, person will never become a as fluid as they can be. Plus, it damages one, it damages also their perspective of self because they're what we just taught that individual is that wow, you just really have to work at reading, you're just never going to be able to sell it. That. It's not smart enough to get it. Just, and so that's going to impress them on that and we give them that image. And the other part, then this part is great. Um, this one frustrates me that the individual also begins to shut down. Their creative space because the creative space was the thing that's been causing them to struggle and their body just kind of shut that down and they actually do what's called block and they block themselves from being as as creative as they could have been which is why we're the choosing the innovation. innovation those are the two things we've seen in our especially in our adult clients and we can open that back up through the sequence of you know program work and things that can be reopened and explored. But yeah, but that's because this is actually another question that so I understand what you're saying about the school structure because when I was a kid I wanted to take part of chairs and mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. 
And, uh, you know, I didn't really work well with structure, but also I needed structure because I had no idea at the time of my age on what to do. Now as an adult, I can problem solve and say, oh, this is a problem, I can go solve it on my own. So the classroom structure isn't as useful. The question is how do you integrate the two? So like, for example, internet is basically a playground for those great people where they can go find all this information and come together. But what about like when you're a kid, you don't really know that type of learning style. So can you bring them together where you have all well, the structure and an structure? You know, it's actually have? not. It's just cool one more thing. My kiddos went to a school, our kiddos went to a school for two years that was amazing called Touchstone Elementary in Oswego. It shut down because it was owned by a big company that decided to sell it. Um, and they taught on a, in a project based, hands on learning environment. So they learned about the Underground Railroad and reading. They'd read about it. They'd do some artwork to go with it. They'd um, create some models to go with it. They would act out a play that was also. So they were integrating all those different types of learning into it. Um, so if you weren't good at reading, you also got to express yourself the art. And we have this year taken on some of those kiddos at a little school in our house, in our basement. And um, visual spatials just innovate like yeah. crazy, but still have that structure. This is math time. This is language right. arts. Yeah. You it's need to stay in your fun. chair here. Yeah, everybody yeah. needs structure. Structure, but not. Right. Mm -hmm. it's not too much. Like maybe half the day, you're, like you're saying, integrated. Another half, you have free time. You're like, here, here's, here's something cool to try. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and just freedom it. within the project. Freedom, yeah. So, um, and I've seen this at our local public schools, and some of the teachers do it really well. They say, okay, we need to do this project on Shakespeare. You can do one of several different types of things. You can uh, make a, part, a scene from the play with some friends and videotape and edit it. Or you can write up on an essay comparing the protagonist and the antagonist and how they work together. Or, you know, there's a, so you can um, work with a variety of processing styles and learning styles within the context of still learning the same subject. And how cool to be able to assess on the front side. And you have your little campers come in and go, okay, let's learn assessments. All right, your cognitive process is this, and your learning style group, optimal learning style group is this. And okay, great. Now, this allows us to tailor our teaching, and it also allows us to help them understand, wow, I'm visual spatial. Right, that works like this. But when I need to sit down and be able to turn that off, slow myself down, and do a structured piece, like a writing piece, I can do that. I have control. It's not bad. It's just simply things have a time. Don't they have a time to be creative and do all this great building things or taking chairs apart. Or it's time to turn out. That's not great. And, and that teaches a whole other dimension too, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we go through life and, and run into people that we think this might apply to, how can how can they learn more about it and how can they learn more about what you two are doing? So we have we have a website you can find us at um, on point learning solutions and that will talk about who we are, what we do, and um, it has our contact information. So send us an email. Oops, I'm sorry to hear from you. Right, do this. Oh, there we go. Here we are. And right now. Awesome. Cool. Thank you.